Welcome to the Author Blur Podcast. I'm speaking with Robert Boog today. He wrote Shaky Madness. He's the person that for any Shakespeare fanatic fan or somebody interested in Shakespeare, this is the guy you want to listen to. He's going to explain to me and to you why he believes that Shakespeare had bipolarness and why, because of that, the person that we believe and who we've been taught wrote Shakespeare is not really who wrote Shakespeare. So we dive into his past, into Robert's passion, and find out why he believes this, what made him write this book, and what he hopes that you will learn from it. So join me. Let's listen to Robert talk, and then you can make your decision on your own. Hopefully you enjoy the conversation. You might possibly want to learn more, so I do encourage you to buy his book. And after all that, you can leave a note, leave a rating, or let other people know about our show. But most importantly, remember, go to authorblurb.com where you can find all the current guests, past guests, and upcoming guests along with a calendar showing you when people will be coming out. You can find authors and learn about them beforehand. Even like right now, you can go there while you're listening to the conversation to find the links, find the information that Robert provided me that is on that website. So I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I look forward to seeing you afterwards and hopefully seeing you again. So I'll talk to you soon. Thank you and enjoy. We're here with Robert, and he has several books, but the one that we're talking about is, it's Shaky... Oh. Shaky's Madness. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry. I've been looking through so many different things. My mind's just all over the place. But it's basically talking about Shakespeare, bipolar, the bipolar disorder that you believe he has, and the um, fact that he might not have been or who we believe wrote Shakespeare was written by Oxford instead of who history saying did it. So let's start off with you explaining to me, if you would, a bit about yourself, and then we can go into your book if you like. Sure. Um, let's see. I was, uh, I am the fifth child in a family of nine children. All right. So, uh, I, uh, my father was a real estate broker and my mother was a real estate broker. So you can tell your friends and family that today you talk to a uh, SOB, a son of a broker. Um, I live in Valencia, California. All right. And uh, I've, um, I've been in real estate um, for a long time. And one thing that um, I had a very strong interest in Shakespeare and I kind of like tapped into his mindset a little bit, but then I kind of forgot about it. Um, oh, actually, I did. I go. I went to uh, England and I visited uh, the Globe Theater, and to me, it just uh, didn't resonate. It in you know, coming from California, I I was thinking of like um, Big Ben and Westminster Abbey that Shakespeare would have lived there and not have been writing you know around you know, like a hundred miles away in this little village. It just right. didn't, you know, I don't know. It just didn't, it seemed like, you know, people who come to California, they want to go to Disneyland and right. like, instead of going to Disneyland, take them to the San Fernando Valley to a miniature golf place or something. So right. anyway. Oh, I understand that. Yeah. Get all excited. And next thing you know, you're sitting there going, well, this isn't close to what I expected. So yeah, I can understand that. So, um, okay, so flash forward to the year 2019, Christmas. Now, my wife is from Guatemala, and we celebrate, uh, Christ we celebrate Christmas by opening presents at midnight on Christmas Eve. And then on Christmas Day, it's kind of like a lazy day where we have a glass of champagne and fall asleep while a movie's playing. And the movie that she chose was a documentary called... Um, Nothing is truer than truth. And in this movie, the filmmaker recreated the journey of Edward de Vere in 1575. Edward, Edward de Vere was the 17th Earl of Oxford, who many people believe was 
Shakespeare. Oh, he wrote the works of Shakespeare. And um, so she put it on thinking that we'd just fall asleep in it. And I could not sleep. It just all of a sudden it was like the domino that, you know, falls down and all the other dominoes fall. Right. Um, because you're in this boat. Just imagine being in a boat and you're in a canal and uh, in the city of Verona where uh, Romeo and Juliet takes place. And mm-hmm. in that play, he talks about a grove of sycamore trees on the north side of the city. Right. And there you see today a grove of sycamore trees. Yeah. So, you, re- you know, you, you think to yourself, whoever was Shakespeare had to have visited Italy. Right. But we know for a fact Shakespeare never left. I mean, the man from Stratford upon Avon, who um, history or history professors or English professors want to tell us was uh, the author of the canon, um, mm-hmm. never left England at all. And right. so um, that, that's really what um, what and then what happened is about a month later was my son's birthday. And of course, I'm going on and on about this movie coming home my wife i learned did not like that movie at all <laughs> she was uh saying you know why couldn't someone of color like a brown-skinned person like myself have written the shakespeare canon so this is really what started everything for me is like trying to prove to her that shakespeare was a, the biggest fraud in literary history the right. man that we call shakespeare did not write the shakespeare canon and I okay. want to show it to you. And I I found three reasons, my own three reasons. Now, I didn't do like typically people would do a lot of, you know, a lot of research for years and years that so people spend like 20 years or five years, seven years. I just wanted to write something that here's an average person who is going to go through the Internet, use Mr. Google or whatever, and um, prove to you that. Shakespeare did not write the Shakespeare canon. All right. So, so what did you end up finding that drove you to actually think that Shakespeare didn't write it? Because I've heard different theories over the years, and they've all been pretty interesting, to say the least. But I'm just curious on what you're thinking. If you could dive into that a little bit, that might be a nice little topic. Sure. Sure. Well, um, the first thing that um, I I give three reasons in my book. Uh, The the first one is Shakespeare lacked an extensive knowledge of Latin, number Mm -hmm. one. Number two, he didn't have the time, meaning the time to write and rewrite. And number three, um, we see Shakespeare did not have bipolar disorder i'm i'm gonna say i call it a mental disorder because i can't really be certain but i'm pretty sure that he had bipolar disorder and and that's kind of like you know the the um, title of the book shaky's madness yeah. let's talk for a second about uh, an extensive use of uh, knowledge of latin just to give you an example right. you know um there's a man named sir stanley wells who is like the uh, number one expert on Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And he has a list of plays. And and all I um, do in my book is look at the years from 1592 through 1594. All right. According according to uh, Stanley Wells or Sir Stanley, uh, Shakespeare wrote five plays. Okay. And he forgets that he also wrote two long poems which is uh, Venus and Adonis and the Rape of Lucrece. Right. So, he, so he actually wrote seven works in two years. In these two years, if you look at the sources for these um, plays and poems, I counted over 40 books in Latin that the real author would have had to have read. All right. And that's just reading. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not even talking about writing. All right. And he, now, we, uh, there was a man named uh, Ernest Hemingway who once wrote that a, the first ra- draft of anything is garbage for a writer. Mm-hmm. And if you look at 
you know, the the play, I mean, the poem Venus and Adonis, for example, that's um, that's over like that's like writing a 50 page poem that rhymes. Right. And the rape of Lucrece is even longer. So, I mean, just those two poems could take someone, I mean, just to write and rewrite as a, as a writer. This is where I'm coming from because I've written other books. Right. And I know I'm um, and having just written one sonnet like Shakespeare. I mean, that that took me a month to do. And right. now we're talking about, you know, you're talking 50 lines versus, uh, you know, 12 lines or something. Oh. Um, and and they're all perfect. So it's um, also, um, like I said, my wife is from Guatemala and she uh, was raised speaking Spanish. Mm hmm. I took three years of Spanish in high school. Now, who do you think um, knows Spanish better, her or me? Oh, it makes perfect sense. It's just she does. Your wife, native yeah. speaker. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of like that where we say, you know, we, there are no records of uh, the man from Stratford attending school. And yeah. yet, um, if he did attend school, he dropped out at age 14. All right. So um, now we have him at age 20 or 22, you know, reading 40 books in Latin. And these these books had not been translated into English yet. All right. So therefore, he had to be he, he had to have had an extensive um, knowledge or, of Latin. Okay. Now let's look at Edward de Vere. Edward de Vere um, started learning Greek and Latin at age four. Mm -hmm. He was tutored by a man named Sir Thomas Smith. So what his parents did, his uh, father and mother, mother dropped him off at the house of Th Sir Thomas Smith, who was a um, Cambridge scholar. He and his wife were, were childless. So they took Edward under a, their wing and taught him and, you know, uh, Smith taught him Greek and Latin. He All was right. so well accomplished in Latin that he attended college, Cambridge College at age eight. He graduated at age nine. At 14, he attended Oxford University. I mean, yeah. it's crazy. He graduated at age 16. Now, you had to know Latin in order to attend college back then. Okay. At age 14, a man um, dedicated this uh, history of um, like Heroditus, I think, something like that, to Edward de Vere. Now you're talking about dedicating, um, you know, this uh, volume this, <laughs> to a 14 year old boy. I mean, really. Okay. So, and that was all not translated into English in these books of Latin. So we know that Edward de Vere was, um, he was an expert in Latin. All right. so that's that. Okay. So that we know that he had, um, he had an extensive knowledge of Latin. Yeah. Yes. That makes sense. He was also 15 years older than the man from Stratford. So this gives him plenty of time to write, rewrite, write, rewrite. So he could have written 15 um, plays, 15 poems, 15. I mean, he, the, the list go whatever you want in 15 years, not just two years. So it, um, it suddenly takes the 40 books that you would have had to, re you know, read in, you know, two years and spreads it out over a much more manageable 15 or 14 years. All right. So let me ask this just out of curiosity, because mind you, I, I have a very limited understanding of Shakespeare in the sense of, I know quite a few of his major plays, Romeo, Juliet, Caesar, all those uh, Hamlet from what I've heard and from what, the different things I've been told over the years, there's a theory that Shakespeare actually put on the plays, directed, did all this stuff, and then somebody wrote everything down after the plays. So would these, who would Oxford or the other gentlemen have been in the vicinity of that time to interact with William Shakespeare to record these plays and, or is that, theory just completely debunked by now well 
um, it's kind of like this acrimonious. I didn't realize it until I wrote this book, how acrimonious this divide is. Either you believe in the man from Stratford as the author and chumming around with his pals and writing plays like that, like you say, right. or you believe that it was someone else, whether it was um, Edward de Vere or as you call him Oxford okay. or Sir Francis Bacon or some other person. Mm-hmm. And uh, there, there are many others. What, um, what I noticed from, again, uh, what, what, here's what happened is um, I was watching, you know, the state of California was locked down due to the coronavirus. Yep. So I was watching TV in the morning, something I never do because I'm, I work all the time. Right. And um, I noticed this one commercial kept coming on. It was for Latuda. And I kept wondering, uh, you know, they must pay a lot of money for this thing. And because it's it's shown so many times, what is Latuda? So I took out my cell phone and I um, Googled it. You right. know, Latuda is um, a medicine that costs fifteen hundred dollars for a 30 day supply. Okay. And it's used to treat bipolar symptoms. All right. And so I kind of Googled what is bipolar symptoms? What are what is bipolar disorder? Right. And um, I learned about that. And then um, later that day, I was on Twitter and I was kind of doom scrolling. And there was a video by Sir Patrick Stewart. He was reading a sonnet a day. And right. the sonnet that day was filled with doom and despair and death. And I thought to myself, hey, it looks like old Shakey could have used some Latuda. And um, then I thought, what if that was true? What if the real author was enduring bipolar disorder? All right. I mean, he certainly wouldn't have any medicine. I mean, e- even to this day. And here's the thing I get from people is that how can you diagnose someone who lived over 400 years ago with bipolar disorder? Right. And um, because I did send it out to uh, my, I sent out my book to a, uh, some psychiatrists and one of them sent me an email back and said, you are the first person in history to suggest that Oxford had bipolar disorder, but your view might be strengthened by adding this or that to it, All which right. were just a couple of more little items, which I found and included. Yeah. Um so he did. People do not disagree with me. They, you know, because a lot of the characters in Shakespeare. So my idea is if you can find these um, symptoms of bipolar disorder that we see in the characters and in the plays and poems of William Shakespeare, right. the real author would, would you not agree, would have those same traits because writers write what we know. We, you know, we kind of put ourselves into our works. Trust me, I'm a little aware. Yeah. Okay. So uh, one of them is fainting. Mm-hmm. One of the symptoms of bipolar disorder is fainting. All right. So um, it, it's, it's actually called racing thoughts and fainting is associated with it. So, okay. um, and, and see, here's the thing. Uh, what, what I believe is that Edward de Vere suffered from epilepsy as a child and fainted. And then later, his um, he, he um, bipolar just uh, well epilepsy can it's like it, it never goes away. It, mm-hmm. it uh, the latest theory at least or one theory is that childhood epilepsy is never cured. It morphs into bipolar disorder. All right. So this is a, a like a newer study, but to this day. Getting back to that point about um, how can you diagnose someone 400 years ago with bipolar disorder, people today in, t- in the year 2022, there is no like swab in your nostrils for bipolar disorder. Right. It's the mood disorder. So people will say, you know, the psychiatrist will say, well, how, how were you feeling yesterday or what was your mood yesterday? Right. And um, there are actually websites, you know, a quest for the test. People are trying to actively raise money to create a test so people can be diagnosed um, more um, intelligently with these mood disorders. All right. And um, so that was my um, thought is that if we see these things and um, in the poem, 
Venus and Adonis, we see like two or three times people faint and they faint for reasons of, you know, that are not, it, it has nothing to do with uh, dehydration or someone was pregnant or it's just, uh, they faint because of strong emotion. Right. So it's, um, some people say it will, some people have told me, well, maybe that's the way plays were written back then. And um, there's actually this British um, physician who, uh, who analyzed every play, every poem of William Shakespeare and came up with Shakespeare uses this uh, fainting by strong emotion um, like 10 or 11 times and all other playwrights of that time period only used it three, three right. times. So it's not, it's like uh, they may have been copying him for all, you know, we know. Well, he was more focused on that symptom than others seem to be is what it sounds like. Well, he also had suicides too. Right. Suicide, um, thoughts of suicide is a bipolar disorder. Yeah. I mean, so when Hamlet's talking about, you know, to be or not to be, he's expressing, you know, should I? Should I knock myself off or what should I do? Yeah, exactly. So let me ask this. All right. So everything sounds like you have a very in-depth research. It sounds like there's a very strong case for what you're saying, but bipolarness, Oxford wrote the actual Shakespeare. So I have the entire collection of Shakespeare in my bookshelf. My problem is, is I've never been able to get through it because just it's hard to read for people nowadays with it being written the way it is. When most people think of Shakespeare, they think, oh, this is going to be a boring topic, this and that. What is it about your book that would drive people to want to read it? I mean, is it going to be the same type of energy that you would get from trying to read a Shakespeare today? Or is it something that's going to draw people in? I saw the reviews where people seemed to be the reviews you had on Amazon where people did seem quite energetic about your book did seem like they enjoyed it so what do you think it is that's going to draw somebody in to want to read your book and the type of person that's actually going to enjoy reading your book okay so if you're a person who enjoys real life mysteries like what who was db cooper or why did he jump from that point so my my focus is not on the shakespeare plays but the person behind it so okay. what I do is I try to bring the journey, um, the reader on a journey that all we're looking at is evidence of whether of who was the author, really. So, okay. again, the reason why Shakespeare is a fraud, that's my contention, that he was just a front man. He um, his father, you know, um, you know, people have looked at um, Shakespeare stuff for over 400 years, okay. you know. I just uh, in um, my discovery in, and, you know, we're talking about a guy who looked at this stuff for a month or, you know, not really that long. Um, I discovered that his father actually lived five miles outside of Stratford upon Avon. He lived in a town called uh, Ingon Meadow and he was renting a 14 acre, you know, 14 acre farm plus uh, 107 acres. Um, so a total of 121 acres, and that's where they actually live, five miles outside of Stratford-upon-Avon. Right. And there's a document on the Shakespeare documented website, which is where, um, so what I do in my book is, uh, it's very conversational. One of my favorite writers is uh, David Barry, and he used to be a humor writer. And so my book is filled with like these little stories. Um, for example, um, you know, when I'm talking about, uh, my wife is from Guatemala and um, and I've I only you know studied Spanish for three years, but I picked up a lot of vocabulary along the right. way being married to my wife. Right. right. And um, OK, so and we're in real estate. I get this phone call, uh, the Spanish speaking man. He's thinking about selling his home. And so mm-hmm. I tell my wife, hey, let me do the, um, you know, the introduction. Now, in real estate, it's called the establishing rapport where you walk in someone's house and let's say that they have a set of golf clubs there in the corner and you notice that and you say hey mr smith you like golfing 
I do too, you know, and that, that puts right. you on the same level as the other person. It, it so it's a connection. Yes. Yeah. You try people like people who like the things that they like, you know? Right. So, um, okay. So I, I walk, <laughs> we walk into this home and they have these two little poodles and um, they were so cute. And I bent down to pet them and they've been freshly groomed. So they smelled good, you know? So right. I wanted to say, um, you know, in Spanish, sus perros suelen rico, you know, like your dog smell good. But uh -huh. it came out uh, sus perros suelen rico because my, um, I have a problem rolling my R's in Spanish, you know. So uh -huh. and I, I looked up at the gentleman and he had like a little sparkle in his eyes, you know, and I looked at his wife and she was kind of like, you know, trying not to laugh. And my wife had her arms folded like in, you know, like <laughs> giving me a look. So I knew that I said something wrong. And right. um, on the way home, she said, hey, dear, what did you tell those people when we came in? And I said, uh, you, you know, your dogs smell good. And she said, no, you didn't say uh, dogs. You, you said pedos. And I said, um, OK, uh, I did. She said, you know what uh, pedos means? And I said, no. She said, well, what you told them is your farts smell delicious. <clears throat> so, uh, well, that's a way to break the ice, I guess. Yeah. So, uh, OK, so my point with that is that, OK, Shakespeare, if he learned any Latin, you know, or people will tell me, you know, Abe Lincoln, he lived five miles from school and he used to walk every day to school. Why okay. couldn't William Shakespeare, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, the thing is, is that. Abe Lincoln went to school like three months. His school year was three months long. Right. You know, we can, and that was 1809. We're talking 1570, right? right. So um, it's, you know, it just does not add up that he would learn this uh, Latin. Then seven years later, it's, you know, n not re, you know, not do anything with his Latin because he got married and had two, you know, three children. Okay, And then all of a sudden he's reading 40 books in Latin. Um, again, my BS meter maybe is a little bit higher. You know, the, the, one of the things that got to me, you know, originally was why, what was going on with Shakespeare's wife? Right. right? I mean, didn't that, didn't that ever bother you? I mean, when, um, didn't she, she, she never suspected that her husband was a writer. I mean, that that never made sense to me. In other words, in in England, they have this statue to these two men, uh, John Hemmings and William Condell. They were the guys that, you know, um, are credited for finding the plays. They what they did is they gathered the old quartos that um, that they found that had been performed at the Globe Theater mm -hmm. and. I mean, this is the story that they gathered them together and created the first folio, which was published in 1623. All right. So, right. It, this is I mean, I'm not making this up. This is what they say. Now, to me, that does not make sense. I mean, because I guess because I've been married. Right. I'm thinking, why when they just go to the wife? I mean, Shakespeare died in 1616. Right. Okay. And they, they gathered the old quartos before his or after his death, or I, I assume. Right. Okay. The Globe Theater burned to the ground in 1613. So you would, and that's where they had the old quartos, right? So where did they get all these old quartos? You know, that, it just didn't add up. And the and his wife was illiterate. So um, why didn't they, if she, he was writing at home, wouldn't he have a writing desk, some pens? No, he gave her an old bed, but um, that's all we know. The second hand bed went to to her, mm -hmm. but no Bible, no books, no, you know, nothing else kind of. So the whole thing just to me reeks of like uh, it does not make sense. Now, on the other hand, um, the first folio is dedicated to two brothers, Philip Herbert and his brother, William, I think. All right. And um, Philip Herbert was married to. Susan DeVere, who was the daughter of Edward DeVere. All right. Philip Herbert was like a multimillionaire. And, you know, he he published 723 or 25 copies of the first folio. So um, 
I don't know. There's a saying, happy wife, happy life. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if your daughter (laughs) uh, or I'm sorry, if your father was an author and you wanted his works to be published, wouldn't it make sense that you would say to your husband, hey, let's let's get this thing published. Right. And if and we know that Edward DeVere had a secretary and a secretary often makes copies. Right. So it would make it to me I, in my mind, I can see it more as, you know, he once he passed away, the secretary gave these copies to the daughter and she gave it to her husband. Mm-hmm. So, well, I mean, it sounds very convincing. It sounds like you have everything figured out with it sounds like it would be an interesting read. So let me ask this. If besides authorblurb.com, where I have a profile of you on there, along with the other books you've written, where can people find you if they want to be able to get more information on you? If they want to buy your book, where do they go? You can go to uh, my website, robertboog, one word.com. All right. I've got some stuff there. I'm on uh, Twitter, All right. link, LinkedIn, um, you know, uh, just the usual Facebook, uh, stuff like that. I understand. And I do have links for all those profiles on authorblurb.com, and I'll include them in the author's notes. So finally, before we end this conversation, I am curious, what do you really hope that people's going to take off take out of your book if they read it what is if you have within just a couple words what would you say your goal for people to get this gift from this book would be get a better understanding it's kind of like this when okay this is the only book that i've actually gotten uh, emails from people thanking me for writing it so okay. if you have if you know someone who's uh, suffers from bipolar disorder or is enduring bipolar disorder Mm -hmm. um people have told me that um you know like hey my brother has bipolar disorder so i you know i appreciate you writing this book because it opened there are a lot of people that have bipolar disorder it's not the end of the world it's not it doesn't you know criminalize anybody and it it doesn't stigmatize people i mean it's a part of them I want people to, I mean, open their minds a little bit, too. And, and, and that goes with the literary world, too. There are a lot of famous people that have endured these mental disorders. And instead of, like, um, you know, shunning them, they, they, he could not have written this well. Why not? I mean, this is just a part of them. It's not, you know, it's, uh, I guess that, that's my hope is that it humanizes Shakespeare because we know he was a human being. And mm-hmm. so it, it also connects the, the, you know, it logically makes more sense. Like the play Othello, for example, you know, um, Edward de Vere, when he returned, uh, he went to Italy. When he came back, his wife uh, had given birth to this girl, to a, a baby girl. And he didn't speak to her for about five years because he thought that, some other person had been the father right. and uh, so he was insanely jealous and when you see that you add this jealousy and then there's a play called Othello where this guy's insanely jealous mm-hmm. um you know you kind of like it makes um um one of the sh- plays by Shakespeare more meaningful when you understand a little bit more about the author I think it just makes it more interesting and that's what it sounds like you've achieved from everything you've told me. So I'm hoping that people go out, buy the book, especially people that are interested in learning more about history, learning more about Shakespeare being bipolar. Again, your website, Robert, which is R-O-B-R-E-T. B-R-T. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so in Boog, your last name is spelled B-O-O-G. So again, If you don't want to write it down, you can go to authorblurb.com where your profile is, or you can see the show notes below. Robert, if you can hold on one second, I'm going to, we're going to end the show and then I'm going to talk to you a bit before I let you go. Sounds good. Thank you very much. I appreciate having you here. Oh, thanks, Eric. Thank you. Well, that was an interesting conversation with Robert and I surely did enjoy it. I hope you did as well. I'd like to remind you, you can go to authorblurb.com 
and find more information on Robert as well as other guests that we've had. You can also find out about the upcoming guests, who's going to be on next week's show. You can find out what authors have come, what authors are coming, and sort them by either their categories and learn about their books. I look forward to having you there. If you do like the show, I would appreciate you going to also show support. That there is where you can either buy me a cup of coffee or even donate through crypto. Please keep in mind, I'm also working on a program that is going to benefit you as well as a supporter of the show. So as time progresses, I plan to be able to offer you more so you can enjoy the show and its content even better. Thank you, and I'll see you soon.